many of you can say that you almost killed a turtle with carrot sticks? Or that you changed the world with a three inch by three inch piece of paper? Four days, one news story, and five million views. This is the story of how I made positivity stick. It begins when I was three years old and I was on my way home from summer camp. They'd given us a goldfish and a cup to take home, and when I got there, I realized we had nowhere to put them, so plop, in with my daddy's pet turtle. Now, you may be able to imagine what happened next. The turtle snuck up, grabbed my goldfish by the tail, and ate him. So here I am, three years old, facing the horror of a loved one dying. I ran to the <laughs> freezer, grabbed a bag of frozen peas and carrots, and began my projectiles. Screaming at the top of my lungs, die turtle, die, I assumed that my words would do the rest. Seeing as he was a turtle and probably couldn't understand my words, childhood Caitlin learned lesson number one, carrots work well for anger, and also that my words must have been useless. I would someday learn that I was wrong. Shortly after that, I learned lesson number two. When I was in kindergarten, I was taught sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt us. I grew up in this ideology, lived it, breathed it. I mean, it was probably my response to every kid on the playground. Imagine me on the field coming up to play, and little Jimmy goes, no, you can't play with us. I don't like you, you're ugly. And I would say, no. Remember what our teacher said? Sticks and stones. You know, I feel that that phrase was really used more commonly to make people play with you, or maybe it was just me. Thinking back now, I'm not sure how many of my teachers had actually broken a bone, but trust me, it hurts. That year, I remember sitting around the carpet. We would have intellectual discussions about how Larry the Lion doesn't push and shove, or how Mommy and Daddy would not want us saying bad words out loud. Apparently, my teacher had never met my parents. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> it's one year later, and I'm barely six years old. I was in the first grade, the best grade, assuming that my words cannot hurt someone. Because back then, all you had to say was, I'm sorry. We were, after all, Canadians. <laughs> so I go on living my life, and by the time I hit the fourth grade, I was still living off my childhood lessons, because when I was a kid, that was the best advice they gave us. You see, as a small child, playground words were simple, and the real bully was the kid who said, no, you can't play tag with us. The barely four-foot boy who convinced you that you had cooties. The boy who looked at you with a sort of utter disgust, a look of, how dare you ask to play tag with us? How dare you assume you could be graced by our presence? And that act of cruelty would be the only thing on our minds, at least until snack time. That afternoon, we'd run home, slam through the back gate, in the doors, crying aloud, Mommy, Daddy, Joshua H., the bully, he bullied me today. Because back then, cooties was an epidemic of the sandbox, and bullying was no more than simple playground words. All right, skip a few years. When I hit the sixth grade, things began to progress. The ew, you can't play with us, became ew, who would want to play with you. When I was no longer a kid, the playground bullies turned into hallway tormentors. Words like weirdo and funny looking were replaced with words like freak and ugly. What was originally a sorry after bumping into someone's in the hallways became a get out of my way. And as I prepared for high school, I noticed that something had left. Society had left its care and empathy behind. Students no longer went gallivanting across the soccer field, waving to anyone we met. Students were ditching classes, spray painting the school's walls, bullying one another. And it was in the ninth grade that I truly realized something. I realized that my teachers were wrong. I'd fallen out of trees, and I'd fell down the stairs, and sticks and stones never left the type of scars that some words had left on me. They were worse. When I hit the 10th grade, I'd given up on my lessons as a child. Gone, completely given up. Anything our teachers had taught us was proven wrong. And while struggling to find a place to fit in, I decided to just wave the white flag. Why bother, right? Once again, childhood Caitlin was wrong. I would learn one day that the answer to my problem was within me all along. Let me explain. When I was a kid, my life revolved around one thing. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, recess. That 30 minutes of freedom where you ran in the field screaming, climbed high atop the monkey bars to impress your friends, felt the wind in your greasy little elementary school hair. And then there were the games. Let's have a show of hands. Who here remembers Red Rover? Red Rover, Red Rover, please send someone over. More like send someone over to break an arm, am I right? <laughs> but do you know what that game really was? I do now. 
When I was in the 11th grade, I realized that Red Rover taught us all something. That as scary as some things may be, life is like Red Rover. Often, it appears that you're all alone at one end, and the rest of the world is waiting at the other end. It appears that they're waiting there to stop you, and that can be pretty scary. But the purpose of Red Rover wasn't hide, was it? That game taught us that you should face your fears head on, go running full speed towards them, and hey, if you break an arm in the process, don't tell mom. No, really, if you get hurt, stand back up and go at it again. Eventually, you will succeed. As a kid, we like to call this the secret playground code of not being a wimp. But today, I call it empowerment. And empowerment is what taught me to stand up to my own bullies. You see, one day, someone in my school halls took matters into their own hands. They broke into my locker, stole my tablet, and wrote a status. On my social media, they turned their playground words into words like slut, fag, and bitch. And right in that moment, I was playing real life Red Rover, all alone at one end, and what appeared to be the rest of the world waiting to stop me at the other. And when I felt like I was most alone, I decided to run. Run straight towards my fears and face them. I realized that my story was not the only one. That students, adults, and elderly were facing issues of bullying every day. With the technological advances facing modern day society, cyberbullying has become far more prominent. The evolution of bullying began with Jimmy on the playground and the plague that fascinated many, cooties. But when did it get to the point of online make-belief and terrorization? As I sat alone in my room that weekend, I realized that this had gone on too long. It was time for me to take a stand, not just for me, but for the millions of people worldwide that suffer from bullying. <coughs> Began when I took a trip to my local supermarket. It was time for me to arm myself with my words. I bought as many packages of post-its as I could. I proposed a solution, kindness. That weekend, I went home and wrote positive post-its, as they would be called. I had taken each one of these negative words that were directed at me and changed them. I turned slut into loved, bitch into outgoing, and fag into fabulous. I had hundreds of phrases to write on these positive post-its. And one of my favorites actually came from Pinterest. You are a sprinkle cupcake in a world full of muffins. <laughs> and the positivity spread like the plague. I would soon be receiving messages from places such as the United States, Peru, Sweden, where they started their own movement, Algeria, with post-its in the middle of the desert, Australia, where an entire class put up post-its, Japan, where this post-it is on top of the Tokyo Tower, or even in New Zealand, where veterinary students decided that they were going to write their own post-its, and here in Chile, and so many other places. This would soon have a day. Positive post-it day. I would soon realize that this positivity was truly spreading. Within four days, the news story was plastered to newspapers, on national television channels everywhere. This message of positivity became a beacon of optimism. But there was one reason this day became so successful. It was firstly the support from people in my community and from complete strangers everywhere. Those who stood tall with me to find a way to end the negativity. But truly, it was because millions of people chose to be that one kid in Red Rover. To run straight at their fears and face them. To take back their words. And take a stand against bullying. <coughs> Since then, I've become an anti-bullying advocate. I've spoken to thousands of people of all ages worldwide. The topic being that an act of kindness can end bullying. I've spoken everywhere from my home in Alberta to Japan. And one of my favorite places is actually the Calgary Police Center. I speak to at-risk youth about my story and how they can make a change. In fact, it's been several of these students that have inspired me. One of my favorite post-its I ever received came from this day. Were you born in McDonald's? Because I'm loving it. <laughs> Funny, right? But it was the same day that a student shocked me by using the term victim in relation to me. I never considered myself a victim. Students would slur words in the hallway with such frequency that it became a staple in ordinary life. Between having a heart defect that slowed me in gym class and chairing my school's gay straight alliance, I got used to it. But no student should have to utter the phrase, I'm used to it. The harsh physical treatment of people worldwide needs to end. I realized that day that I was a victim, just like thousands of my peers were. But it was finding a solution that would be the hard part. That weekend, I walked into my school and I put up 800 post-its. 
Wow. Now it's led me to the TEDx stage where I am able to come up and speak to all of you and everybody connecting worldwide about the power of a positive phrase. But it's not just that. It's about the simplicity of an act of kindness. Because this world has over 7 billion people. We have drones that can retrieve our purchases, cellular devices that can bring two people together from oceans apart, planes that can fly you anywhere you choose. And in this advanced bustling world, in this digital world, one act of kindness spread. One piece of paper, a girl who chose to change the world, a very analog idea, completely changed the face of the planet. Four days, one news story, and five million views. Because as my mom always said, one drop of positivity can wash away an ocean of negativity. I may not be a millionaire, a child genius, a newspaper editor, or a blogger, but I am a human being. A human being that changed the world with one piece of paper. Thank you.